In this video, I'm going to go over how to solve the coding practice questions in Lab 1. Don't expect walkthrough videos for every single lab in this course, but in this case, I think for people just getting started in programming or getting used to this new programming language, even if you have experience, it's nice to see some worked examples so that you can pick up strategies for how to solve these problems. Okay, so here's lab one. Here are three coding practice problems. The first one says implement the repeated function, which takes a one argument function f, a positive integer n, and a parameter x. It returns the result of composing or applying f n times on x. And then it gives you this diagram which says f is going to be applied to the result of calling f on the result of f applied to f applied to x. Where dot 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 is meant to represent that we don't know in advance the number of times we're going to apply the function. That's because our function is generalizing over all the different structures that look like this. It takes in an argument n, and that n tells you how many times to apply f. Now, no doubt that's a confusing description, but fortunately we have examples. So the square function just squares x. Repeated square 2, 3, we see is equivalent to square square 3. So the 2 says we're squaring twice. 3 says that's the number we're squaring twice. And if we square 3, we get 9. We square it again, we get 81. If we square 4 just once, we get the square of 4 is 16. If we square 2 six times, we first get 4, and then we square 4 to get 16, then we square 16 to get 256, and eventually we get this big number. And then there are some other examples. And then it says your code here. And the lab01.py file contains the same contents. So how might we get started? Well, it seems like we should worry about making sure that we can apply square at least once, which we'll do just by writing f of x. So then at least we can get this example right. But we know we want to apply it multiple times, and that should be a clue that we'll use a while statement. In fact, we know we're supposed to apply it n times. So we need to write a while statement that will execute the body of the while statement exactly n times. The most typical way to do that is to keep track of how many times you've executed the body of the while statement so far, and then while, write while k is less than n. So if n is 2, k will start out at 0, and we'll increment k each time so that the first time through, k becomes 1, the second time through, k becomes 2, and there is no third time through because then um, k is the same as n. So this general structure of saying while k equals k plus 1 and then do some other stuff, everything indented here below this line will be executed n times. So we want to kind of like f of x or something like that. And then after all that computation, we want to return some result. Now, this is not the solution to the problem yet, but it seems to have a lot of the right structure. So when you think you have generally the right structure, because you're repeating something n times and you're applying f to x, you shouldn't be too quick to start deleting what you have. Instead, run through some examples. So what happens when I repeated square 1 and 4? Well, that actually works. Um, n is 1, x is 4, f is the square function. And so one time, I'm going to square 4 to get 16, and I'll return that result, which is correct. But what doesn't work is repeating square twice. So the first time in this example of square square 3, we would have n bound to 2, x bound to 3, f is still the square function, which means that this is going to get executed twice, but it will do the same thing each time. The first time, we'll square 3 and bind that to result, which seems like we're making progress. But if we execute this line again, we'll just square 3 again and get 9 instead of 81. What we want to do is 
second time through square 9. And what's that? Well, that's applying f to not x, but the result. So I almost wish, like the first time, I called f on x, and then the next time, I called f on result. I could write that out with an if statement, but there's a simpler way. Instead of calling this result, we'll just call this x. And this is a common pattern in while statements that an argument that's passed in, the name gets reused to keep track of some sort of accumulation. So in this case, we're accumulating the number of times we've called f on the result. Our original example still works. I won't walk through it, but I will walk through this example again and show you that the first time, at the very beginning, x is bound to 3. When you call f on x, now x is bound to 9. We execute this line again, and um, so now we're calling square on 9, and x is bound to 81, which we return. Let's see how we did. Ah, the tests pass. Let's solve the next problem. So the next problem says sum digits. Write a function that takes in an integer and sums its digits. So 4224 two, four would have a digit sum of 12. So this is a classic computer science problem. Um, there are lots of ways to solve it. But most of those ways involve using features of Python that we haven't even discovered yet. So if you happen to know something in advance, I would challenge you to try to use the ideas that we've presented in lecture in order to solve all the problems so far. That's much better practice than using features that you read about somewhere else, like on Stack Overflow. OK, so in order to sum the digits, we're going to have to iterate through all of the digits and sum them up. There's a general pattern for that as well, which is that you say, well, n is less than 0, I'll rebind n, and I'll keep track of the last digit by dividing n by 10, and then taking the remainder of dividing n by 10. Now remember, both of these are executed before n is changed. But after this line, n is changed. So let's print n and last after we do this, just so we see what values we have to work with in the rest of this while statement. So instead of running OK, I'm just going to run Python directly, load in the contents of lab 01, and call some digits on 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to see what it does. Nothing. And that's because I wrote the pattern wrong. This should be while n is greater than 0, we're going to get rid of one of its digits. OK, running it again, some digits 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is a way of taking a look at each digit in a number. The first time we execute this line, now n is not 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 anymore, but just 1, 2, 3, 4. And last is its last digit, 5. When we perform that same operation on this number, we end up with the last digit, 4. And then again, the last digit, 3, then the last digit, 2, then the last digit, 1, and is now 0. And so we're not going to repeat anymore. And as you can see, through these five consecutive print statements, we have access to 5, then 4, then 3, then 2, then 1 in that order. So going from the last digit all the way to the most significant digit, just by using this pattern of computation. Now, of course, our goal was not to print out all these numbers, but to sum up the digits. Now that we have access to each digit, all we need to do is keep track of the total so far. So the total will be whatever total we had plus the digit that we're observing now. And I'll print that out too, just to see what it does. So here we have the sum of all the digits so far, which is just 5. But then we get 5 plus 4 is 9, 5 plus 3 is 12. And eventually, we have the total, which is 15. That's the sum of all the digits in the original number. So the last thing we do is return the total. The return happens outside of the while statement in order to say, I want to complete this entire process before I ever return a value. If instead, OK, so I'll get rid of the print. 
Let's just check our work. Python 3, OK, Q some digits. Success. Now, indentation is really important. If instead I had returned here, I would not have success. I would start having errors. And why is that? Well, the original version says, complete this entire while statement, and then return the total. This version where I indent says, the first time I go through the while statement, as soon as I reach the end, I want to return. And as soon as you return, you can't perform any more computation. So this will only give me the last digit of whatever number I passed in, instead of summing up all the digits, because it returns too early. So that's the right answer. Indentation counts, because we need, Python needs to know when the body of the while statement ends in order to figure out when to start repeating. OK, last one, double eights. Write a function that takes in a number and determines if the digits contain two adjacent eights. So 8 only has one 8, but 8 8 has two 8s in a row. And 8 8 0 0 8 8 has two 8s in a row. 1 2 3 4 5 doesn't have any 8s. And here is the tricky case. So 8 0 8 0 8 0 doesn't have two 8s in a row, because it always has zeros in between. This is another example of look at all the digits in order. So let's write down the same pattern we had before. While n is greater than 0, n comma last equals n divided by 10, n percent 10. Now we don't just want to print out last. We also want to print out whether we just saw an 8. Because the way we'll discover that there are double 8s is that last will be an 8. And also, the thing that we just saw after last is also an 8. right? That's how you see two 8s in a row. So the key insight for this problem is that you need to keep track of another value called just saw an 8, where at the beginning, you did not just see an 8. But what we'd like to have happen is that you process this 8, and you say, oh, I just saw an 8. And then you see this 8, and you just saw an 8. And so you've seen double 8. Now, how will we set just saw an 8? Well, if it's the case that last is 8, then just saw an 8 is true. So let's print out last and print out just saw an 8 to see how we're doing so far. Double 8s, and we'll call it on 8. OK, so it knows 8 is an 8 whereas 5 is not. But those aren't the interesting cases. The interesting cases are 1, 2, 3, and then we put an 8 in the middle. Ah, so this says uh, after 5, I didn't see an 8. 4, I didn't see an 8. Oh, there's an 8. But then it thinks it kept seeing just saw an 8 throughout. And that's a problem. Because here, we didn't just see an 8. We just saw a 2. So we need to extend our code. If the last number wasn't an 8, then just saw an 8 is false. And I could have used any name I wanted here. I'm just using something descriptive to keep track of what it means. So if I now run the same thing, uh, it only keeps track of when I just saw an 8. So that's good. That means there's hope. If I had 1, 2, 8, 8, 5, then it will know it just saw an 8. Now, there's a tricky issue with the order of the statements in this question. We'd like it to be the case that the important event happened here when we saw the second eight in a row. But what we're printing for this line and for this line are the same. And that's because we're computing just saw an eight before we check last and just saw an eight. So what I'm going to do is move this line up here and run the same program again. I'll keep the old version on the screen. Now we're seeing something really interesting. When we observe the 5, it's not an 8, so who cares? We observe the first 8, but we're not too excited because the last thing we saw was not an 8. But when we see the second 8 in a row, we also keep track that we just saw an 8, and that's an important event. That's a double 8. 
Now later on, we see a 2 and we just saw an 8. That's not so exciting. But at least we're keeping track of the fact that the last digit, the digit that I observed previously, is an 8. And we can keep track of whether the current digit is an 8 too. And we're in good shape. So here's the place, right here, where we printed. That instead of printing, we're going to put in another conditional statement that says, if the digit I'm looking at is an 8 and I just saw an 8, then I saw a double 8. Return true. So if I run this version of the program on 12885, it says true, because there's a double 8. But 12845, well, it returns none. And that's because I haven't really said what happens when I get all the way to the bottom of this while statement. If I get all the way to the bottom, that means I've looked at all the digits and I've never seen a double 8, so I should return false. This is another common structure in an iterative function. You're looking for something. When you find it, you return true. If you looked everywhere and you never found it, you return false. Let's see what OK thinks. OK thinks we got it right. Now a common problem that students have is that they leave in a print statement, which isn't so bad, but it does offend OK. So OK will say, I expected false, but instead you printed something out and then returned false which is the right answer according to the description of the problem, but it's not what OK expected. So look at the output that you see. You might have even gotten the right answer, but you just forgot to remove a print statement. So now it works again. And the right thing to do is not to leave this commented out, but just delete it before you submit so that the function is nice and clean.